This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, instead of joining the doctor at his home, we're all meeting here at Camp Roberts in California where the doctor is going to tell his story before a large audience of G.I.s. And, as usual, I'm going to tell my story right now. It's about Petri California Sherry. And I want you to know that Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. Before you sit down to dinner some evening soon, just pour yourself a glass of Petri Sherry. Look at that rich, dark, amber color. Just smell the fragrance of those wonderful grapes. And then taste that Petri Sherry. Mm, is that ever good? And say, if you like your sherry on the dry side, you know, not sweet, then just wait till you taste Petri Pale Dry Sherry. If some of your family like regular sherry and some like pale dry, don't buy one, buy two. You can't go wrong so long as you buy Petri. P-E-T-R-I. Petri Sherry. And now let's join Dr. Watson and get on with our story. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Doctor, your study seems a little bigger than usual this week. <laughs> yes, my boy. I felt that as tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was rather an exciting one, the men here at Camp Roberts might like me to, to tell it to them in first. I'm sure they will, Doctor. Which particular story have you selected? One that I call The Strange Case of the Murder in Wax. It concerns one of the most sinister mass murderers who ever threatened the peace of London. In the summer of 1900... And the city had been rocked by a series of ghastly murders on Hampstead Heath. Hampstead Heath? Yes, Hampstead Heath. That's a large rambling park in the suburbs of London, Mr. Bartell. And noted as a rendezvous for young lovers. It was here that the elusive murderer, knife in hand, was wont to roam at night time, searching for his prey. All of his victims were young girls. And despite the frantic efforts of the police, each murder seemed to be as baffling as the one that preceded. Finally, of course, as usual, Scotland Yard came to Sherlock Holmes for help. It seems almost like yesterday, Mr. Bartell, that Inspector Lestrade stood in our Baker Street rooms, imploring Holmes to handle the case. Mr. Holmes, you've got to help us. I don't mind telling you the yards at the end of its rope. I sympathize with you, Lestrade, but I don't see that there's much that I can do. Only the police can handle the widespread detailed work necessary to this case. The private detective is helpless. Yes, perhaps if you'd come to Mr. Holmes in the first place, Lestrade, he might have helped you. But the murderer hasn't finished yet. There'll be more killings if we don't catch him. You mark my words. Mr. Holmes, please help us, won't you? Before I commit myself, Lestrade, give me the exact chronology of events, will you? All my information on the uh, murders has been derived from the London newspapers, notoriously inaccurate in matters of fact. I can give you all the particulars, sir. I've been on the case right from the beginning. All the murders have taken place on Hampstead Heath at night time, and all the victims have been young women. Who was the first one? A girl by the name of Oakley, a Bessie Oakley. She was a shop girl who worked at Derry and Tom's in Kensington High Street. Three weeks ago, she was out on the Heath with a young fella by the name of Alfred Smith. He told me it was a moonlight night that night as they sat there out on the heath. Come on, Bessie, give us a kiss. <laughs> oh, go on, Fred. Don't be so soppy. I ain't soppy. Come on, Bess. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Who's this coming towards us? Blooming prowler. Here, you, what you want? Well, can't you say something? Look out, Bessie's got a knife. No, you don't. Well... <laughs> Devil, you, you, you hit my friend. Keep away from me. Keep away from me, you. Ah! And that's all I know, Inspector Rod. I never got a good look at him. He caught me on the head, and when I come to, there was poor Bessie with a throat cut. Yeah, that's your story, young fellow, my lad. All right, Sergeant. You can book him on suspicion of murder. <laughs> George, we shouldn't be walking on the heath. Didn't you read about the murder here two days ago? It's a fine thing. I, I take you out in the moonlight and you talk of murders. 
Let's talk about us, Violet, darling. It seems to me we should talk about your wife. My wife doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Violet, if I could get a divorce, I... There's someone behind that tree. He's coming towards us. Who are you, sir? What are you... No, you don't. I... Oh. Don't come near me. Don't. <laughs> Inspector Lestrade, she's, she's dead, poor girl, I know, but... A scandal can't bring her back. If there's any way to keep my name out of the papers, I... Yeah, I'm afraid you'll have to take your chances, Sir George. Oh, and Sergeant... Yes, Inspector? Yeah, you can turn that boy loose, we've held for questioning. The man who did this is obviously the same killer. I'm afraid we're going to hear a lot more from him. Light edition, evening paper. Hempstead murder strikes for fifth time. Nine girls murdered on Hempstead Light edition, evening paper here. Now, look here, miss. You can't go walking by yourself on the east. It ain't safe. Uh, thank you, Constable, but, but I'm not frightened. I want to be by myself. And I want to think. Well, I can't stop you by law, I suppose, but you shouldn't do it. Yeah. I don't know how to handle these modern young things, and that's a fact. <laughs> Inspector Lestrade, he must have killed her the moment she got out of my sight. I searched the old ruddy Heath, but I couldn't find the murderer. But it did startle him. He left his knife in the body. Good, Jackson. Uh, the body's uh, not been identified yet, eh? No, Inspector. Uh, we'll print a photograph in all the papers. We've got to find out who she is. <laughs> Mr. Bishop, is the, this the uh, body of your missing daughter? Yes. It's Rosie. My Rose. Inspector Lestrade, if I ever lay my hands on that murdering fiend, I'll kill him. I'll kill him with my bare hand. Here's the story, Mr. Holmes. Rose Bishop was the tenth and last girl murdered. But she was the first girl murdered when she was alone, eh, Lestrade? Yes, sir. You found no clues? Well, none that proved anything when we checked on them. Let me ask you a question or two, Lestrade. Well, anything you like, sir. You've taken the obvious precautions, of course. Oh, how do you mean, You sir? posted a heavy police guard on the heath? Well, yes, sir. We've had a hundred plain men walking there at night ever since the second murder. But he, he seems to slip through our fingers. I suppose you've also posted policemen dressed in women's clothes. Yes, Miss Holmes. And we've hired girls to walk the heath in couples with our plain clothesmen. But the murderer it won't seem to rise to our bait. Oh, he's a cunning brute. Yes, he is, Watson. Obviously a morbid madman obsessed by a hatred of love. It'll be hard to catch. Mr. Stroud, you mentioned clues that amounted to nothing when you checked them. What were these clues? Well, uh, footprints, a couple of cigarette butts dropped at the scene of the crime. Nothing that helped us. The only important clue was the knife we found in the body of Rose Bishop, uh, uh, the uh, last girl murdered. Because the experts at the yard examined it. Yes, sir. Didn't tell us a thing, though. You have the knife with you? <laughs> Here it is, Mr. Holmes. I knew you wouldn't trust us. <laughs> You'd want to look at it yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Lestrade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, what is it, Holmes? Huh? This knife is a collector's item. It's at least a hundred years old, I should say. May I keep this overnight, Lestrade? I should like to conduct a few experiments of my own. Why, of course you can, sir. Then you're going to take on the case, Holmes? Now, let us say that I'll take it under advisement. I'll do my best, Lestrade. I'll do my best. Well, thank you, sir. If any further developments occur, communicate me at once, will you? Yes, sir. In the meanwhile, I'll smoke a few pipes on the problem. But I promise nothing, my dear fellow. I promise absolutely nothing. <laughs> Up in the morning, home. You're still peering through your microscope with that knife for Stroud. Yeah, that's you? true, old chap. That's quite true. I must be a very dull companion. Why don't you go to bed? Oh, because I'm afraid I may miss something. Confound it. Have you discovered anything? Yes, I think so. Oh, what? The handle of this knife is corrugated. On the underside, I observed a slight diffusion in the markings. Under the penetrating eye of the microscope, I found a minute deposit which had caused the diffusion. I have just analyzed that deposit. It's wax. Colored wax. Colored wax? Well, what does that signify? Oh, by itself, very little. But when you combine it with a knife that definitely belongs to another century, it does suggest a certain origin. I've got an idea. Perhaps it came from the theater. An 18th century dagger could belong in a period play. 
And the coloured wax might easily be part of an actor's makeup. Uh, excellent deduction, Watson. Oh, thanks. <laughs> However, my own theory would be that this dagger came from a waxworks exhibition. Oh, wrong again. Putty is used in theatrical disguises, but I don't recall the use of coloured wax. Whereas it is used in making wax and effigies, and of course the dagger would belong as part of the costume. Precisely, my dear fellow. It's a long chance, but uh, I think in the morning we'll make a tour of the various London waxworks exhibitions. If my deduction is a false one, at least we'll have the pleasure of a busman's holiday. We can visit all our old friends who died on the gallows. <laughs> Tired, old chap? Uh, I must say I'm a little weary. This is the fourth waxworks exhibition that we've been to. The fourth and the last. We failed to find any clues here at the Vex Museum. We can return to Big Street. Well, oh, thank heaven this is our last port of call. I'm so dizzy from looking at waxworks that they begin to look like human beings to me. <laughs> Did you notice that I asked directions from the wax policeman at the entrance door? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure many people have been uh, deceived in the same way. Uh huh. Here we are. Oh, Monsieur Levesque doesn't believe in understatement, does he? Look, look at that sign oh, there. Good gracious me. The Chamber of Horrors, come in and see the pageant of murder. All the people of history reenacting their famous crimes. Well, <laughs> let's go in, Watson. We should feel thoroughly at home. Creepy in here, isn't it? I've heard that Monsieur Levesque will pay a hundred pounds to anyone who will spend all night alone in the Chamber of Horrors. Yes, I've heard of that challenge too. Are you thinking of accepting the bet? Great Scott, I can spend a night here for a thousand. A very comprehensive collection of killers, aren't they? Let's see, Williams, Wainwright, ah, uh, Archonis de Brinvilliers. By George, yes. She was an attractive woman, wasn't she? As trim a pair of ankles as ever I've seen. Yes, but you wouldn't have liked her cooking, Watson. She used the most lethal condiments of almost any woman in history. Hello. What is it? Look over there. Uh, I was wondering when we'd come to one of your cases. Dr. Grimsby Rylett and the murder at Stoke Moran. Or the case of the speckled band. By Joe Holmes, the tableau's extraordinarily realistic, isn't it? Yes. One of my other old friends of mine are represented here. Rather like her, a new acquaintance with Riccoletti of the Clubfoot and his abominable wife. Riccoletti? I don't remember him, Holmes. Oh, one of my earlier cases, old fellow. I must tell you that story sometime. I wish you would, I've off. Holmes. Look, that veiled figure over there. Read the placard in front of it. The Hampstead Heath murderer. Well, how very interesting. The face is covered with a black veil. Is this pure showmanship, I wonder, or does Monsieur Levesque know more of Scotland Yard than die? Good day to you, gentlemen. Yes, Scott, you, you startled me, sir. Are you admiring my collection of murderers? Monsieur Levesque? Yes, sir. And haven't I the distinction of addressing Mr. Sherlock Holmes? That is my name, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, Doctor? I am greatly honored to meet you both. What do you think of my chamber of horrors? Oh, oh, it's very impressive. We're particularly interested in this veiled figure of the Hampstead Heath murderer. Yes, indeed we are, sir. Is there a face behind, beneath that, that veil? <laughs> I'll let you in on a trade secret, gentlemen. There are no recognizable features behind that veil. This is purely for publicity purposes. The public always expects to see the latest horrors here. And I, I thought I'd titillate their morbid palates by, by having a mysterious figure representing the killer. Of course, if he is captured, I shall add his effigy to my collection. You think he will be captured, then? One can only speculate. He's a clever man, Mr. Holmes. By the way, Monsieur Levesque, does your offer of a hundred pounds to anyone who will spend a night in the Chamber of Horrors still hold good? Oh, yes. Are you thinking of accepting the bet, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, but Dr. Watson would like to. Well, Holmes, I don't I recommend the experience, Doctor. It's an ordeal that calls for nerves of steel. However, I shall be glad to arrange for oh, I haven't the slightest intention of... Uh, backing this, down now? Of course you haven't, old fellow. What time shall my friend return, sir? About 11.30 tonight. I'll be waiting for him at the main entrance. Splendid. Come on, Watson. Oh, Holmes, I... Good day, Monsieur Levesque. Good day, gentlemen. I shall be waiting for you tonight, Doctor. Holmes, what the blazes do you think you're doing? I haven't the slightest intention of keeping that appointment tonight. Well, of course you haven't. I shall keep it. Disguised as you. You keep... For heaven's sake, tell me what you're up to, Holmes. You didn't even mention that missing dagger to Levesque. No, because he knows something about the murderer. I'm convinced of it. Well, why'd you say that? As we were standing there talking to him, a breath of air from the open window blew back a corner of the veil. I'll swear that there are clearly defined features beneath it. And so you're going back there tonight to find out. That's right, old fellow. 
The superstitious used to believe they could use a waxen image to kill a man. Tonight, Watson, we shall prove that a waxen image can be used to trap a killer. Dr. Watson will continue his story in just a second, so I'm just going to remind you that there are lots of ways to make good food taste better. But the easiest way is to serve that food with a good wine, a Petri wine. If you like a white wine with chicken or with fish, you'll love that wonderful Petri California Sauterne. If you like a red wine, then rich, hearty Petri California Burgundy is your wine. But if you don't know which you prefer, why not try them both? Petri Burgundy and Petri Sauterne, red and white. Don't buy one, buy two. But always buy Petri. Well, Doctor, so Sherlock Holmes decided to disguise himself as you and spend a night in the Chamber of Horrors, yes, huh? Yes, Mr. Bertell, after dinner that night, he began to apply the makeup. It's uncanny to sit there in Baker Street and watch Holmes slowly turning into a very convincing replica of myself. As he did so, we discussed last minute to rain. See, I'm coming here to 11.30, Watson. If I'm not back here by 2 o'clock, you'd better come after well, me. Well, you should let me come and wait outside, old fellow. Just in case there's any trouble. No, 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 no. You'd attract attention. By the way, um, do you recall the name of the girl murdered on the heath? Yes. Bishop. Uh, Rose Bishop, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. The only girl who was murdered when she was unescorted. The body was identified by her father. What of it, Holmes? Levesque is a French name, and yet the gentleman had a decidedly English accent. I should say that, uh, he adopted a foreign name as being more suited to his profession. I don't see what you're driving at. What's the connection between Levesque, the owner of the waxworks, and the father of Rose Bishop, the murdered girl? Levesque is the French word for bishop. Great Scott. You think that he knows who the murderer is and... Uh... I know only one thing, Watson. I may see who's beneath that black veil. Yeah. Now, how's my disguise? <laughs> Wonderful. You look exactly like me, but... <laughs> How do you, you manage about the voice? Well, don't think that'll be too difficult, old man. I'm for the back of the well. I can't understand half what you're saying. In your own case, old chap, that's a handicap that I've suffered for years. Rubbish. I'm perfectly intelligent. Now, let me see. The uh, bullseye lantern. Yes. Uh, Watson, I think I'll borrow your revolver, too. I probably won't need it, but uh, for once, I think it might be safer for me to go armed. Here, you are, Holmes. Now, do be careful. I will, old chap. Don't worry. Goodbye. And if I'm not back by two o'clock, you better come to the waxworks and see what's happened to me. Uh, Dr. Watson, you don't mind if I search you? Oh, good gracious, sir. No, of course not. Uh, and, uh, no, no lantern, please. The uh, moonlight will give you all the illumination that you need. Oh, dear me. A revolver in your pocket. Mm. I'm afraid I can't allow that. Oh, no. Once before, a young man who unwisely accepted my bet left bullet holes in some of my finest waxworks before he finally went raving mad. Oh, gracious me, raving mad, did he? Oh, oh, were here. Uh, don't be frightened, Dr. Watson. Many of the waxwork murderers here are all friends of yours. Uh, they'll be good company. I shall come and release you at eight in the morning. Yes, but no, no, no. I'm, 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 well, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've sealed all the windows with string and wax. I shall seal the door behind me as I leave. Well, it's very unkind of you. Ah, midnight. Yeah. The bet is on, Doctor. You still wish to go through with well, it? I suppose, I suppose so. Very well, then. I shall leave you now. Yeah. Uh, good night, Dr. Watson. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams, Dr. Watson. Something about the shadows. Which home should we have with me? He's at the window. Great Scott, it's Watson. And now before his time. Well, here got the seals and the string. Up with it. Holmes. Holmes, are you all right? Shh. I'm all right. You came early. But it's just as well. You're carrying a lantern. The vet took mine with him. Come on in. Uh, oh. Shh. Uh, there we are. Go on, little quiet. I'm glad to see you, Watson. But uh, what made you decide to come here so early? After you left the start, Kegger, Baker Street. He 
He told me there was another murder on the heath at another seven o'clock tonight. Another murder, eh? I started worrying about you, Holmes. Mm. I had a premonition of impending danger, and I decided to come over here. You're, you're not angry with me? Oh, of course not, my dear fellow. I'm glad of your company, and I appreciate your concern. Have you looked under the veil of the waxwork figure of the Hampstead Heath murderer yet? No, I was just about to. Your lantern will be most useful. Come on, Watson. Oh, what have you been doing? Just to... Just doing nothing? Yes, yes. I, I wanted to give Lafitte an impression that I was here for the night, and I also wanted to do some serious thinking. I smoked two pipes on the problem, Watson, and I think I know the answer now. I'm willing to swear you'll know the face you see when I lift the veil from the waxen dummy. Here's the figure. Now, put your lantern a little higher, will you, Jim? That's it. I lift the veil, and who do we see? Good Lord, it's the waxwork figure of Lavec himself. Precisely, Watson. An unparalleled example of the self-betrayal inherent in criminal egotism. Levesque couldn't resist the... Holmes! The waxwork is moving! It's got it! It's alive! Yes, gentlemen. Which is more than either of you will be in a few minutes. You re-entered this room by a secret door, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. And since you've displayed such a flattering interest in the Hampstead Heath murderer, I decided to remove the wax figure and appear in person. Look out, Holmes! You've got a revolver! Oh, no, 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 Doctor. This isn't a revolver in my pocket. What would the Hampstead Heath murderer want with a revolver? This is a knife. I feel so much bone with a knife. There are two of us. Remember that. And both unarmed. Which one of you meddlers wants to die first? Look out, Holmes! Watch it, watch it, both together! The lantern smash. Yes, and the moon's fading. What a pity. Holmes! Where are you? Over here by the effigy of Macbeth. How very thoughtful of you to provide him with a dagger, Levesque. A wooden one, my dear Holmes. <laughs> you can't escape me. I can feel my way in the dark here. I know every inch of this room. You're doomed, both of you. Don't strike a match, Holmes. You'll make a target of yourself. Get over that. I'm lighting this newspaper. It'll make an excellent torch to set light to the nearest waxwork. No, no! Don't burn my waxwork! Why not? Wax on a wooden frame should blaze brilliantly. There we are. Oh, oh you devil! You're destroying my life's work! Holmes, that burning wax is pouring all over the floor. The curtains are catching light. The whole place will burn down. Oh, my beautiful museum! Ah, I thought this would smoke you out. Quick, watch at him again. What's that knife, Holmes? Well, Mr. Holmes, you've done it again. You've solved the case in a blaze of glory. <laughs> get the point, sir. <laughs> a blaze of glory. Yes, Mr. Stroud, I get the point. Thank you very much. Pass that marmalade, will you, Watson? Uh, uh, Holmes, is that the morning paper you brought with you, Lestrade? Yes, Doctor. Uh, want me to uh, read you the headlines? Yes, yes, please, please do. Yeah. Amstead Heath murderer captured in fire that destroys waxwork exhibition. You know, Mr. Holmes, you and the doctor were lucky you went burned to death. Never mind the chance you ran of having your throat cut by that maniac. It was fortunate that the police and firemen were on the scene as quickly as they were. Levesque had the strength of ten men. Yes, the strength of a madman. He'll never stand trial, of course. No, doctor. He'll end up in an asylum where he belongs. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, what made you suspect Levesque? You first gave me the clue yourself, Lestrade. You uh, told me that all the murdered girls were accompanied by men when they were attacked. All of them save one, Rose Bishop. Therefore, if the murderer was vent by hatred of love, he had to uh, had to be someone very close to Rose Bishop to know that she was a suitable victim. That point alone, which I was shockingly slow in observing, should have told us to focus our attention on the father, Mr. Bishop, alias Lovick. Well, your theory was certainly right, Mr. Holmes. You should have heard his raving after the arrest. He swore his daughter had been ruined, and so he'd killed her too. Holmes, the, the waxwork figure of the killer, the one with a veil over its face, the features underneath were those of the of Levesque himself, weren't they? I'm certain of it, old fellow. You see, he had two great prides. The first, his natural pride as a fine craftsman in wax. The second, his perverted pride as a prominent and successful murderer. These two prides combined suggested to his crazed mind that he make a wax figure of himself and range it with the other great killers of history. Yes, but he was cunning enough to protect himself by placing a veil over the Precisely, face. Precisely, my dear fellow. And when he saw us yesterday and we accepted the wager, he undoubtedly became suspicious and removed the wax figure last night and made his personal appearance as the murderer with every intention of killing us both. Yes, we were very lucky, old chap. Yeah, if you ask me, Mr. Holmes, you've been very smart. No, I quite agree, Lestrade. I think you solved the case brilliantly, no, Holmes. No, 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 no. I've been very sluggish. I... Solved by circumstance and melodrama what should have been a purely intellectual problem. I'm not pleased with myself. 
Strand, I hope that my name has not been used in that newspaper report. No, it hasn't, sir. Excellent. I want no credit in this case. Well, do you mean to say that you're going to let Scotland Yard get the praise for catching him home? Why not? Well, that's very generous of you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> It'll make things a lot easier for me. Yes, it certainly will. Holmes, uh, I can't see why you reproach yourself. Because, my dear Watson, like the Hampstead Heath murderer, I, too, have my pride as a craftsman. This case had a clearly defined pattern, and I was unable to recognize it. If you should have occasion to chronicle this story, Watson, and I should prefer that you didn't, I I would like you to entitle it The Education of an Idiot. Oh, come now, Holmes. The Education of an Idiot? Oh, that's absurd. I know. <laughs> but um, if you do tell this story, it'll probably end up as um, The Strange Case of the Murderer in Wax. <laughs> Well, Doctor, that was sure a swell story. You know, that's the kind of story I like. Lots of action. Well, that's the kind of story I like to tell. You know, Mr. Bartell, although our broadcasts were heard overseas every week through Armed Forces Radio, this is one of the few occasions that I've had the privilege of really telling my story directly to the boys. And it's been a great pleasure for me to be here at, at Camp Roberts. Well, that not only goes for you, but for me too, Doctor. And for the Petri family. There are... There are no words to describe how much our country owes our servicemen. And to all of you, the Petri family wants to say, just as every American wants to say, thanks for a swell job. Well, Dr. Watson, what story are you planning to tell us next week? Next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you one of the strangest adventures that ever happened to Sherlock Holmes. It takes place in a, in a monastery high in the mountains of Tibet and concerns itself with an avalanche, an execution... And a murder. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Second Stain. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Baldwin Mayor. Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday night on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.